seminar series. I'm Adrian Fu Berman. I direct um, our master's program in health and the public interest, which is an interdisciplinary master's program uh, where we aim to uh, we aim to foster health advocacy um, and help make our students effective advocates for a better healthcare system. Um, we're we're uh, very pleased today to have Dr. Peter Lurie and um, our happy student uh, Divya is going to introduce him. Hi everyone, my name is Divya Ramalapalli and I'm a student in the Happy program. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Peter Lurie to you all today. Dr. Lurie is the president of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, which is an independent science-based consumer advocacy organization that aims to improve the food system to support healthy eating. Previously, Dr. Lurie was the Associate Commissioner for Public Health Strategy and Analysis at the Food and Drug Administration, where he studied antimicrobial resistance, caffeinated beverages, arsenic and rice, expanded access to investigational drugs and prescription drug abuse, among others. Prior to that, he was the Deputy Director of Public Citizens Health Research Group, where he addressed drug and device issues, co-authored the organization's Worst Pills, Best Pills Consumer Guide to Medications, and led efforts to reduce worker exposure to hexavalent chromium and beryllium. Earlier as a faculty member at the University of California, San Francisco, and the University of Michigan, he studied needle exchange programs and HIV policy issues. Aside from his work in advocacy, Dr. Lurie is also a big soccer fan. Fun fact, he has attended every World Cup soccer competition, save one since 1974. And also his favorite COVID pastime has been picking up playing the piano again. Welcome, Dr. Lurie. Okay, Divya, thank you very much um, uh, for the introduction. Uh, and Adrian and, and V, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I. I, I did just send you the, the presentation. I had seen your request for that earlier, but maybe I'll just try and share my screen. Um, that way I can, um, <clears throat> you know, operate properly um, myself. Let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, it looks like it's this. All right, Adrian, can you confirm that you see that? Yes. Okay. And might be good. You, are you seeing this stuff over here too? Uh, yes, if you could put it in slideshow view, that would be good. Which one is that? Uh, Go sorry. up to slideshow and then do play from start. Uh, up here? Mm -hmm. Hello. And then from beginning, yes. Perfect. Okay, voila, excellent. Okay. All right. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. This is what, maybe the third time, I think? Certainly the second. Um, that, uh, that I've spoken to this group and it was great fun before. So I'm very happy to be back. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, two things today. Uh, the first is, uh, and the predominant portion, if I can budget my time correctly, is uh, talking about advocacy tools for outsiders. And I'll set that up in a moment. Uh, the second is just talking about some things that uh, we or I have been doing recently uh, related to the COVID pandemic um, from, from an activist perspective. So uh, those are the two parts. Um, the the uh, first part is uh, actually only half of a longer talk, um, and uh, which is fine. Um, the longer talk is about uh, the ways in which one can be an advocate both within the government and outside of the government. Um, and uh, I was asked just to, to focus on the stuff for uh, taking the perspective of out those outside the government. So that's what I'll talk about today. Um, for that, you just need to understand um, or remember a little bit of, of Divya's uh, generous introduction, uh, which is you know my own, my own history, which I'll just quickly go through again because you can lose it in that bio. Uh, I was for a time an academic um, I was for a time a, an, a, an activist with a group called Public Citizen here in Washington. Uh, after that, I, I took a position at the FDA during the Obama administration. And since that administration ended, uh, I've been the, as it says, president of the Center for Science and the Public Interest here in Washington, which is a advocacy group that focuses historically mostly on food. Um, but one of the things that I've been trying to do is um, move us in some new directions and 
uh, the COVID epidemic has provided an opportunity for us to do that. So that's uh, the background. And so you'll see uh, different of these advocacy tools um, used not from the period when I was in government, obviously, that's the different talk, um, but uh, from the various phases of my academic and activist careers. Okay. Um, Adrian, are we going to hold all questions till the end or uh, should we allow people to jump in in the middle? Do you have a view on this? Oops, can't hear anybody. At the end. At the end, okay, all right, that's fine. Okay, all right, so let's go. Um, so we're gonna talk about advocacy tools for outsiders. And what I like to say is um, that activists are lacking for two things, time and money. Um, and I still haven't figured out what to do about the time problem, but the money part, actually there are some answers to this. And there's quite a remarkable amount of stuff that you can do as an activist that's literally free or very close to it, um, or at least spend somebody else's money, which might be just as good. So I, these are some of the tools that are available to uh, folks outside of government. And I'm gonna go through each of these in turn, and I uh, give examples of things that uh, I've worked on from you know, a very wide array of different things. And I, the, the point is not so much to understand the substance of what I'm talking about, although hopefully that'll be interesting. Um, it's more to understand the way in which one of these tools was used uh, in the effort to secure some uh, activist goal. Okay, so think about it from a, the perspective of these tools. So and first, we'll talk about the Free Information Act. So the Free Information Act, as you may well know, is an act that dates back to the early 70s, uh, which allows people, um, whether within or outside of this country, to request documents of the federal government. And the presumption is that the government will provide those documents. Um, and there are exceptions, nine of them to be precise. Um, and sometimes the government, you know, uh, interprets those exceptions rather expansively, and that can reach, lead to a lawsuit. But broadly, they're supposed to provide you the documents that you ask for, unless one of these nine exemptions are met. The exemptions themselves are reasonable. Um, national security is one. Um, personal privacy is another. You wouldn't want somebody requesting your medical records through the Medicare program, for example. That would not be good. So they're, they're reasonable in and of themselves and the question is how they get interpreted. Um, but notwithstanding that, there's an enormous amount of stuff that you can get out of the federal government using this and I'll give you an example. So this is um, a disease, of, this is a previous pandemic, um, which was uh, in the end, not much of a pandemic, except if you're a cow. And uh, th this is mad cow disease, which uh, was a big deal sort of at the, big, at the turn of the, of the century. Um, and what we were interested here is in establishing whether or not testing for mad cow disease was being done in a rational way. It was a very limited question. It was not, is there enough testing or who should pay for testing? It was just, if you're gonna test, do so in a rational way and is the federal government doing that? That was the question. So in order to do that, we decided we would look at it by state and um, we decided to get some data. So the first thing you do in a project like this is open up an Excel spreadsheet. And down in column A, you're gonna put um, all the states, you know, Alabama down to whatever, Wyoming or something, right? All the way down to the, down, down to the bottom. And um, you're gonna list all the states. And column B is you're looking at the rate of testing, right? So you're, you're, what your belief is that all things being equal, since there was not at this point, a single cow that had been infected with mad cow disease, there should be about a, a direct relationship between the number of cows in the state and the number of tests that are being done. That seems rational, right? There's no reason to favor any one state over another if the prevalence is equal and zero uh, all over the show. So you got the states in column A, column B is gonna be your numerator, which is the number of tests. So you go to the USDA website, you take a look, they do have the number of tests, but it's not broken down by state. Okay, that's no good. So that's when you file your Free Information Act request. Okay, so you file your Free Information Act request and it says, you know, I request all data on the testing of this cow, that cow, and the other kind of cow um, by state for the period such and such to such and such. And then you go and take a break because, you know, months and months go by, you completely forget about the project. And then one day, magically, you know, at least in those days, an envelope appears in the mail 
And there it is, the data that you'd kind of forgotten you ever requested. You're like, oh, okay, great. Okay, so you go back to the project and you take the data that they provide and you put them all into column B. Okay, great, now you've got column B. Column C is your denominator, right? That's gonna be the number of cows in the state. And USDA actually has that, and even in those days had it online. And you can get the number of different kinds of cows. In this case, we looked at dairy cows for various reasons and broken down by state. And you put that into the, into the, uh, uh, the column C, that's the number of, 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 of tests, right? In the denominator, column D is column B divided by column C. And once you get that, you, you know, insert a new graph. And the next thing you have a thing that looks like this. And it makes a very simple point, right? In Texas and Florida, they are testing on a per capita basis, where capits are cows, you know, I don't know, 600 times more ca uh, cows than they are down here in Minnesota. It makes a very simple point. And um, uh, we actually presented this before some uh, uh, congressional committee that I was testifying before. So use of the Free Information Act, get you very valuable data, make a simple point. I, I guess the, the other underlying theme of this talk, I should point out if you haven't figured it out by now, is I'm a person who likes data. So I, uh, you know, gathering information, data, analyzing it is, uh, you know, a big part of what I like to do. Okay, so here's a different one. Turns out that states have their own um, Freedom of Information Acts. And so this was a Freedom of Information Act uh, that we uh, request that we filed in Vermont. And we're asking here for the um, gifts that have been given by drug companies to doctors. This is Adrian's big area of interest, I know. And uh, this was an early paper that we published in JAMA that using the State Free Information Act, we were able to describe uh, the, 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 the gifts that were given either by payment, in other words, what, how many of them there were, or by value in dollars. Again, the data don't so much matter, but they're data and they're publishable apparently. Um, they can also be used in congressional testimony. And ultimately uh, we advised or recommended that there be a national database uh, that would include all of these doctor gifts. And indeed the Affordable Care Act had a requirement for exactly that open payments. And now all of this information for every state is available online. Um, so again, Free Information Act. All right, Federal Advisory Committee Act. So to understand this one, you have to know what a federal advisory committee is. And many um, uh, different federal agencies, uh, I know most about FDA, but many of them, probably all of them, have some kind of external advisory committee, right? So this is people who are not working for the government who come in for a day or two, whatever, and they meet and they, they give advice on a particular topic. And we'll get, uh, if we have time, to the, the most recent FDA advisory committee on vaccines that I testified before just last week. So the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, allows these external people to advise the government. It's subject to a number of Sunshine Act rules, which uh, include, for example, that you have to announce the meeting 15 days ahead of time uh, in the Federal Register. You have to allow the public to attend and to testify. Um, you have to have a transcript, you have to have minutes, uh, etc. You have to have an opportunity for the public to testify. I said that already. So and you'll see uh, through this, and if we get to the vaccine thing at the end, you'll see how I and others have used this, the, all of those aspects and, and, how, uh, and how they're relevant even to, uh, actually in the end, they're relevant to whether or not there will be an October surprise with regard to a, an, an AIDS vaccine. So what about these advisory committees? Well, um, they're open, like I said, and um, one of the things that we were interested in at the time was whether or not there are conflicts of interest on these advisory committees. And you can use the transcript of these, which I told you were required. It's like 300 pages long per day. And at the beginning, there's two or three pages in which they say, Dr. So-and-so would like to disclose that he or she has a conflict of the following size with the following company for the following reason, right? And although that just looks like text in a transcript to most people, if you're a data nerd like me, it seems like data, right? Because you will know what the meeting is, what they're talking about, what questions are posed to them, who the advisory committee members are present are, who got recused, who's got a conflict, with what company, for what reason, et cetera, what value. So all of it from that little phrase is data that can be put in, in, in a spreadsheet and you can analyze it. And that's what we did. Um, 
And this just describes some of our results. It shows uh, the uh, fraction of meetings that had at least one advisory committee member with a conflict of interest. And ignoring this, it was 73%. This is back quite some time ago. It's much lower now. And if you do it by per meet by person rather than per meeting, then it's 28%, which is very substantial, I think. Um, but it's it's down like well into the low single digits at this point for a variety of reasons, perhaps to some small degree, the, the, the attention that we got through this. Um, so again, using the advisory committee and the data that it generates for these purposes. Now, another thing that you can do is you can file a petition. Um, and the First Amendment actually uh, permits that. The citizens are permitted to quote, petition their government, right? You remember that, that's what it says. And um, what that means is you fill out a document um, in which you make your case for particular things you want the federal government to do. And you, have to, you can request this of the government. And you know, it can't be, you know, get out of Afghanistan, okay? That's like not a thing you can request, but it can be relabel a drug. It can be uh, regulate occupational chemicals. Those are things that are, you know, or that are requests to particular regulatory agencies uh, searching for concrete, you know, discrete actions that the agency might take. So I'm gonna give you some examples of these petitions. Here's the great thing about the petition. They have to respond to you. And I'll show you what happens when they don't. Okay, so what's an example of a petition? Um, occupational chemicals, this is hexavalent chromium, the chemical some of you may remember from the film, Aaron Brockovich. Um, and uh, it's a well-known cause of lung cancer, it really not contested and hasn't been contested for about 50 years. So when the OSHA Act was first promulgated in 1971, OSHA uh, just put together a temporary standard and it understood it to be that, of 52 micrograms per cubic meter, which was called the permissible exposure limit, okay? And they put that together with the expectation that they would come back to this someday and revise it if it was not adequately protective. Well, it turned out that it wasn't. And between 1971 and 1993, every major occupational health group concluded that it was a carcinogen. Um, that was NIOSH, which is part of CDC, OSHA itself, uh, all kinds of international groups. And so in 1993, the group I was with at the time, Public Citizen, filed a petition with OSHA looking for this you know, 200 fold reduction in the permissible exposure limit, okay? So they were required to respond to us, okay? And what happened was a number of years went by in which they didn't. In fact, four years went by. And because they had not responded to us, we are able to then go to the courts and sue the government under what's called the Administer Administrative Procedures Act for quote, unreasonable delay. And so we filed such a lawsuit saying that they had unreasonably delayed making a decision on our petition. And um, the, when, when, when that happened, that those sorts of cases, at least at OSHA, go to the Court of Appeals, which is unusual, um, they, they turned us down. Um, and one reason was that OSHA said that they were going to uh, put out a proposed rule in 1999. So we lost this case, okay? But one year later, you're going to see this rule. Okay, so take a break for a while, got nothing to do. Well, you file a Free Information Act request with OSHA. You ask them for the results of all the inspections that they've done of workplaces looking for exavalent chromium, which, by the way, is um, you know it, it's you know that, that silvery metal, right? So you you see you see it on bumper plates, you see it in certain kitchen equipment. Um, that's the kind of that's the kind of places where exposure occurs. So we file this Free Information Act request. Eventually, the data come. We analyze it. We publish it. And then you can see the fraction of readings that still exceed the permissible exposure limit. Those that are even now, then, right, back in 99, back in 2000, um, lower than our proposal, Health Research Group is part of Public Citizen. So some of them are, some of them are non-compliant with a, with a terrible standard. Some can even comply with a very stringent standard, then there's a group in between. So we publish this and it goes into the record um, because after a while we've run out of patience. In 98, they promised us a rule, but nothing happens. And so in, in 2002, we sue them again. We say they promised they would do it. They didn't do it. 
unreasonable delay a second time, and this time we win, okay? And this time they say, you have to promulgate a final rule by 2000, and I can't see this because it's six. Sorry, I've got, you guys are sitting on top of part of my slides, so I need to move you around periodically. Um, and so, um, hope it doesn't make you dizzy or anything. Um, so uh, anyway, the rule, they, it, it, it comes with a series of very specific uh, uh, milestones that they had to meet and they met really all of them. And in 2006, they promulgated this rule, um, which was the first rule on an occupational chemical in 20 years, not a single one. And even then only because they lost a lawsuit. As it was, the rule was not really very good. It was, we had asked for 0.52, instead it was, you know, 10 times higher at, at, at five and was the least protective standard in the history of OSHA. So we sued them again, but now we're suing them on a different basis. Before we sued them for unreasonable delay, right? Now we're suing them on the substance of it. And the standard is arbitrary and capricious. You have to show that the agency was arbitrary and capricious in the decision that it made. As you can hear, that's a pretty high standard and we lost. Um, so we sued them in 2006 and lost in 2009. So this is the current regulation, but that's a pretty good example of how the, the, the petition process can work, especially if you have some lawyers to help you. Okay, another thing that's free is media. Um, that's always free. So this one um, is not really about the media exactly, except that it reminds me that as an activist, it's very important to think like a journalist. In fact, there's probably no other uh, group of, you know, no other profession that you're more similar to than journalists. Um, as an as an activist, because you're always looking for news, right? You're looking for things that are new that people don't know about that will, you know, get attention to things you're concerned about. So uh, that's your competition in a lot of ways. Um, so this uh, I mentioned because uh, I was thinking like a journalist when this happened. So, and this is like a one or two hour talk on its own. Um, so uh, it's just like a teaser really of a very, very interesting issue. Um, that turned out to be very important in my life and ultimately you really know, changed it um, and pushed me out of academics because of this, this project. So um, the background here is that we're in uh, the early 90s somewhere, uh, HIV is all over the show and there's perinatal transmission from mother to infant, especially in developing countries. And uh, some researchers in the United States and France decide to do a study in which they randomize HIV positive pregnant women to either get the drug AZT or to get nothing. And that was a reasonable thing to do at the time because there was nothing that prevented the transmission from mother to infant that we knew about, nothing that had been proved. So they do the study and actually it has an enormous effect. There's about a two thirds reduction in the transmission of, of uh, HIV from mother to infant, two thirds, very, very large. And uh, one of the most important, actually, and dramatic, I think, findings, actually, in the history of medicine, I would go so far as to say that. Now, the problem was that it cost about $1,000 to give this stuff, okay? And immediately, people decided that, that would never be affordable in the developing world. And so they decided that what needed to happen was they needed to take this treatment that had proved effective and figure out if you could give a little bit less of it, saving money, and still have some or most of the effect that had been demonstrated in the study. And so I went off to West Africa to give a talk on a completely different topic. And they brought up to the microphone some guy from CDC, which had a post in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. And he was talking about the research that they were doing on mother to infant transmission right there in Abidjan. And so everyone, oh, very interesting. The, the audience were journalists um, because the idea was that the journalists were writing kind of silly stories about HIV um, they were writing about, you know, HIV, were, you know, came from a CIA lab, a HIV, there were drugs that could cure you, they were available in the United States, but not available in Africa, you know, kind of conspiratorial stuff, but they were not writing about things that could actually have helped people in Africa, like, you know, how to put on a condom or something, right, that kind of thing. And um, so it, the idea was to reorient these journalists. Anyway, the guy gets up from CDC and he says, yes, we're doing these follow-up studies. And um, the long and the short of it was I said to him, yeah, that's fine for you to do that because maybe, you know, this, this 
somewhat lo lower dose will be less toxic. It'll certainly be cheaper and perhaps it will work just as well. What's your control group, I said. To what are you comparing this sort of lesser AZT? And he said that it was to a placebo group. And I was astonished by this. I, I didn't think you could do that. Um, if something is known to be effective, you're supposed to offer it to people. And if the NIH or anybody else is funding a research project, it seems to me that you should provide what is known to work scientifically, not what is affordable locally. And so we filed a Freedom of Information Act request, and pretty soon we got these data out of CDC. So it turned out that far from there being only one study taking place in Cote d'Ivoire, there were a number of studies, 18 of them, as it turned out, all across the world. 16 of them were taking place in developing countries. And in 15 out of 16, they were getting placebos. In one, interestingly enough, there were no placebos. They were comparing different doses to each other, but no placebo. Um, when the studies were done in the United States, however, there were two, and both of those people got placebos, which is, I uh, did not get placebos, which is what you expect. So we thought this was a clear case of a double standard. And um, we held a press conference, we wrote an article in New England Journal of Medicine, and it caused a massive ruckus for a number of years. Um, and we can talk about that more if you like um, when we go to the Q&A section. Okay, but the point here again is think like a journalist. I'm there in this room in West Africa and I hear this thing and I'm like, whoa, what the heck is that? You know, this sounds like an opportunity, you know, for real activism here, right? Pay attention, be on, you know, just the way a journalist would. And that's how it came to my attention. Okay, all right. So uh, let's talk about the internet, which is, you know, especially free. This is, a, I'll skip this in the interest of time. This is a funny study about uh, the uh, anthrax uh, outbreak, um, which you'll remember shortly after September 11th, uh, somebody mailed uh, white powder to a bunch of people, mostly in the media around the country. It turned out to contain anthrax and some people, mostly uh, postal workers, um, died. And this is a study of how the websites responded to this. So our question is, um, do you, as a website, do you sell Cipro, which was the drug that treated anthrax? And if so, do you only sell Cipro? And, uh, and when did you start selling it? So these over here are all the websites that are selling, have been selling Cipro and when they started. And you can see they started a number of years back. And here in October, there's this massive increase in the number of websites selling Cipro, which if you blow it up, looks like this. And this is the date that the first attack was announced. And you can see how quickly these websites come online immediately in the aftermath of, of, of the outbreak. I've always thought that somebody in, you know, in the FBI should have looked at whoever this guy is. Whoops, sorry, whoever this guy is because this person started selling Cipro on their own, only Cipro and nothing else, uh, a couple of days before the attack was announced. That's really weird. Um, but anyway, who knows? All right, I'm gonna skip this one in the interest of time as well. Um, this is the, uh, from CSPI where I now am. And the point here is you can use the, the, the internet uh, to gather data. Um, we're interested here in sesame allergy. Um, if you look on, the, on a packet of food, you will sometimes see you know, allergens, colon, in, in bold, and there are eight allergens, like milk, fish, eggs, um, that are required to be listed on, on, uh, on packages. Anything else that somebody might be allergic to uh, is not required to be listed, although a company could list it if they want to. Um, and so we've been trying to get uh, the government interested in, in, in labeling these. Um, the, FDA has an adverse event reporting system, but it's not really for foods. It's really for drugs and devices. So we created our own online portal. And in a very short period of time, we had 321 reports of uh, adverse events related to sesame uh, allergy and some little bit of data, detail about them. We provide them to FDA. We're going to write it up for a journal, I hope. Um, but again, using the internet to, to connect data, collect data. All right, research. So this is sort of where my uh, activist interests and research interests, you know, academic interests sort of come together. So I have a number of examples of this. Um, uh, so all different kinds of research. So the, the easiest thing to do as an activist um, 
if you uh, are interested in this sort of thing, the easiest thing to do is to criticize somebody else's research. That's really easy, right? Now that costs not a penny and you can do it very quickly. So I've spent quite a lot of time writing letters to journals complaining about bad stuff other people have done. Um, and it can be quite effective. So this one, um, I usually do this as a, as a uh, interactive thing, but I'm not sure, you know, you suggested I hold the questions till the end. So I, I'll just do this and sort of explain it myself. Um, but this just think of it as interactive and start to look at the data um, as, I, as I talk about them and see if you can figure out what the problem is. So this is a drug called Elocitron or Lotronex. Uh, it's for irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, the question being asked is, does it work? And the right way to answer that question is to get a group of people with irritable bowel syndrome. You ra randomize them to either get placebo or the drug, and you follow them for a certain number of months, in this case, three, and you figure out at each uh, juncture how the placebo group is doing, how the, 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 the Lotronex group is doing, and you average that out at each time period. You put it on a graph, you do some statistical tests, and these asterisks mean that there is, in fact, a statistically significant difference between these two groups, right? So the, the symptom score for placebo is higher than the symptom score for the Lotronex group. So this is a benefit of the drug, okay? So this data is uh, presented to the FDA, and based on this, published in The Lancet, um, it gets approved. Uh, for, for, for marketing for patients with this. Now, I hope by now you've started to look at this graph and see that there are a bunch of things that are weird about it. Um, and if we weren't in Zoom, you'd be telling me what those are, but I'll point them out to you, okay? So just this is where you use your training and your common sense and your own trust in your own ability to you know, make, a, make a judgment. Uh, and you're not deferring necessarily to people who appear to be in great authority than you because they you know, can write something in the Lancet. Okay, here are the things that are weird about this graph. Thing one, it doesn't start at month zero, okay? That's weird. It should start at month zero, right? But it doesn't. That's the first thing. Thing two, what is going on on the y-axis, okay? So this is not a, a scale. It's a percentage change from baseline. So what they had done was measured something called abdominal pain or discomfort. And that's what they would say to these patients. Do you have abdominal pain or discomfort? And they would say, yes. On a, and they'd say on a scale of zero to four, how bad is it? And that's what the answer was. They would say three, they would say two, and then they'd average it out. And then it would be some number, which would be compared to baseline. And this would be the percentage change, okay? I hope that's clear. So then your questions ought to be, what would happen if you looked at this, extended this to zero, and instead of looking at the change from baseline, you instead looked at the actual values of the pain on the scale, right? That would be a fairer way of looking at this. Because for one thing, you actually know what's going on at month zero. Because month zero is here, right? And the percentage change from baseline at month zero is you know zero, right? Because it hasn't changed yet. So it's zero. So that means that for both the placebo group and the Lotronex group, it, the actual graph, if you had gone back to month one, it would be here off the chart somewhere, somewhere around about there, right? That's where it would actually be, okay? So, um, and let me point out importantly that the percentage change for, for the placebo and the Lotronex groups would be the same. Right by definition, zero. So if you actually get the data, you can regraph them, and it looks like this. That's what the data actually look like. Okay. So you look at it this way; it doesn't look like the thing's doing anything. I mean, it is. There's a statistical test that shows it does, but it's really kind of meaningless. And you can see that most of the change actually occurs in month one, not in the subsequent months, and is equal in as a percentage in the placebo group and the, and the treatment group. And so any difference that you see here is a very small fraction of the natural decline that is occurring in the placebo group. So most of the apparent effectiveness is in fact just placebo effect. It is, not, it is not the drug at all. 
Final point, the percentage change from here to here is the same as the percentage change from here to here. Remember I said at month zero, the two, the, the, the point is gonna be, the, 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 the two dots are gonna be on top of each other because they always are at month zero when you have a graph that shows the percentage change. Okay, with me? So when you, if you ever see a percentage change graph, you know they're gonna start together. And that's the visual trick here. They do start together, except it happens to be month one. Okay, so this looks like it begins at month zero, but it actually doesn't. By coincidence, it happens to be superimposed at month one as well. Now, why is that beneficial to the company? Well, because since this now looks like a conventional percentage change graph, you don't have to go back to here. And if you did go back to here, then it would all go up to you know, much higher and you'd have to squish the graph down, right? To make it fit on the page. And the difference over here would be cut maybe in half, right? The appearance of the difference would go down like this because it all has to be squished onto the page. Very irritating. Okay, all right, a little bit more research. Um, uh, and then I should move on to, to COVID. This is a research project about needle exchange programs. You all know what those are. Um, these are all of the reports that ever came out on needle exchange at the point that I did this work. All these different groups, National Commission on AIDS, Government Accounting Office, this is my group, and a whole bunch of very prominent other people. Every one of them concludes needle exchange reduce HIV. Every one of them concludes needle exchanges do not increase drug use. And we say, all right, why is it that we don't have needle exchanges in this, in this country and what are the consequences? And so here we did a little mathematical model, which I guess in the interest of time, I won't get into. It's actually quite simple. And we made a mathematical model that allowed us to estimate the number of infections that had occurred unnecessarily because of lack of needle exchange in America. And then we graphed it out. And uh, depending on how effective you thought the needle exchange program was be, would be over this 13 year period, as many as 20,000 HIV infections could have been prevented had we had a reasonable sized needle exchange program in America, but we didn't. So these people are all dead. Thank you very much, Bill Clinton, especially. Okay, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. Um, here's a special Georgetown project. Um, uh, you know, I, my, my point is we, you do all kinds of research. Most of the research that I've shown you does not involve the primary collection of data. Um, and uh, it's just too expensive and time consuming to do that. So mostly you're criticizing other people's work or analyzing existing databases. The only time that uh, you can do primary data collection is when you have a Georgetown student that'll do it for you. That's the only time. And that's what we had. We had a fourth year medical student, a great guy. And he went in and surveyed first, second, third and fourth year medical students. And he asked them a whole slew of questions about their interactions with drug companies. And this particular one involves pens, which are not supposed to be distributed anymore. And you can tell there's a kind of dose response relationship for a second, third and fourth. Okay. Um, the final thing I'm gonna to touch on is litigation. Um, we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, let me, I'll skip ahead just to finish up on this. Um, past a couple of these uh, to get to this. So, um, this is a slide that shows the drug approval process. And when a company conducts a study, one of the things that they're required to do is list it on a website called clinicaltrials.gov, okay? And that's what this lawsuit is about. Um, so that, that's where this comes in. And this just shows they conduct the studies, they apply to the FDA, and ultimately they get approved or don't. And these are some other documents that you might be able to retrieve, but we're focused on this. So um, I, as I said, clinical trials, a database of, of, of clinical trials, doc, right? In 2007, they required, they made a change. It was not just that the trials had to be reported, but also their results. Uh, and that was in 2007. Um, and, but it took, it took NIH 10 years to finalize the rule that explained that. And when they did, they exempted certain clinical trials of unapproved products. And those ones did not have to be disclosed. And we thought that that was not actually legal. And so uh, some lawyers up at Yale contacted me and asked if I would be willing to be a named plaintiff in the case. And so we sued HHS, uh, asking them to publish the stuff on, on clinicaltrials.gov. And we actually won. 
um, back in February, just before the pandemic, the court ruled in our favor, and it's now required that those uh, particular trials that we were interested in get listed. Okay, so that's the first part of the talk, I think, yes. Um, uh, Adrian, I think I'm gonna plow into a bit of COVID, if that's all right. Is Absolutely, that that'd be great. Okay, so um, I, I think one thing, I've, I've not done a presentation on this before, I, I put this slideshow uh, together just this morning. So there may be errors in it, I apologize. But I, I think one thing that might be worth thinking about is the ways in which some of the things that we've done on COVID are um, echoes of those techniques that I mentioned earlier as being those in the toolbox of, of, of activists who are outsiders. Okay, so these are, this is a list of the kinds of things um, that we have done uh, at CSPI that relate to COVID-19. And I'll go through as many of them as there is time for, okay? So the first one is an evidence hub. Uh, early on, it was suggested to me that it was difficult to find information about what worked and didn't in COVID. And so we started to put together an evidence hub that would have had, would have been like the hub to end all hubs. And it was pretty daunting. It was gonna be, you know, several million dollars to put it together. I had a fabulous team, um, but, yeah, I wasn't the first person to get this idea. And so there were a bunch of, of other people that had done websites and, you know, maybe we would have done a better one. I don't know, but the, some of them were getting to be pretty good. And so we decided to pare back our efforts. And instead, what we did was we made a hub of hubs. And uh, that began actually the way most of these other projects began with the opening of an Excel spreadsheet. So once what we're trying to build up this would be fabulous uh, evidence hub, and I said to the person who was helping me, well, why don't we first find out what, what exists? Let's go and canvas the web and figure out what there is. And so we had a spreadsheet that had all of the then maybe 20 evidence hubs that existed and then information about each of them in the columns. And that actually became the database. It was just intended for us to understand the lay of the land, but we ended up turning it into our own evidence hub. And this is a a shot of the, of the page as it currently exists. So um, there are basically three things that an evidence hub for COVID could offer. One is it could offer studies. In other words, using places like clinicaltrials.gov, it could list all the ongoing studies, or it could have the results of those studies when the studies are completed and written up, or it could have some attempt to synthesize all of the results. It, it, with an appraisal of some kind. And so you could have, you know, be, you could be a website that does only one of them. Um, you could be a website that has two or even three, not shown here, but there's some that do all three of these things. And then you go to our website, you see which one they, they, they contain, and then you can click on any of the three elements, or you can do so here. And that brings you to another page, which I'm not showing, with more information about the studies that are included, like where they source their data from and so forth. From any of these pages, you can click on this website name and that gets you off our website and into the website itself. So the idea is it's a place to go, it allows you to compare websites and then off you go to the website itself. So it's a completely counterintuitive website. It's like a website that works exactly the opposite of the way websites are supposed to do, which is to like get you there and keep you there and sell you stuff. This is exactly the opposite. This is get you to the website, get you off to the place you wanna be and maybe you never come back. So uh, so we continue to uh, maintain this, this hub. And I think it helped to establish our scientific credibility in, in the pandemic to a certain extent doing that. So that's the hub. Uh, somewhere along the line, I got the idea that we should publish a blog and uh, on, 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 on the pandemic, and this is, the, this is it. And here are some of the things that we've discussed and you'll see that some of these come up uh, later on and other things we've done at CSPI on COVID, but we've put up about, I don't know, 35 blogs already since, I don't know when, um, um, was it June? I mean, that's a lot, um, it's keeping me plenty, plenty busy, let me tell you. Of course, there's no shortage of stuff to write about. Uh, it's just actually endless. And the harder thing is figuring out what not to write about. So I sort of specialize in medical products because of my background at FDA. So we do a lot of work on that. Um, we've been interested in worker health, particularly in meatpacking plants, uh, but also healthcare workers, prisons, nursing homes, uh, the retail environment, because that's a 
a CSPI interest. And then we had one person whose uh, grandmother unfortunately died from COVID and she wrote this beautiful recollection that uh, wound up on, on the blog. So um, this has turned out to be you know, a lot of work, but a fun too, a chance to engage in a little bit of creative writing and uh, have your say about things as, as, uh, as they evolve. Um, one, of the, one of those is on a very improbable topic. This is, uh, goes back to something I did, um, I may make the calculation here, something like 35 years ago when I was doing AIDS work. And um, I came to hear about an AIDS vaccine that uh, was being developed. And um, you'll be interested to know that the people who were the people pushing for this were Redfield, the CDC director, and Deborah Burks, who was then, uh, he's number two in the military where this research was done, and who's now one of the main people in the coronavirus task force when she's not being completely marginalized, which seems to be the case. So in any case, they were both involved in this, and that itself is really very interesting. And based on this, we opposed Redfield's uh, appointment to be CDC director. Um, not that it worked. Um, might have been a good thing if they had listened to us the way things have gone. So this is a graphic taken directly from the New England Journal of Medicine. The drug, the vaccine was called GP160. And in this phase one trial, uh, everybody gets the vaccine. Um, and what they do is they look at their antibody response. And if they have an antibody response, then they're called a responder. And if they don't have an antibody response, they're called a non-responder. Then you follow them forward for 240 days. And this one also is a percentage change from baseline, by the way, uh, importantly, because um, uh, that tends to magnify the difference between the two groups. And the claim is that those who respond have better CD4 cell counts and index of immune function than those who didn't respond, which when you think about it is sort of obvious, but in any case, that's the way this kind of work was done. So what's interesting about this is that it turns out that this graph didn't come about lightly. This is a moving average, right? So-called smooth data. At this point, I think actually everybody probably knows what a moving average was. I used to have to explain it to people, but at this point, I think you know, people have been looking at you know epidemic graphs for long enough. I'm not even going to explain it. But you can, when you smooth it, you have a like you've seen this on, in COVID, a seven-day average, a 14-day average, right? You've seen that. And so this is a graph that uh, was smoothing the, the, uh, the, the, these, these counts on this slide, right? They're smoothing them either by, by uh, units of three days, units of five days, or units of seven days, or uh, probably three visits, five visits, and seven visits must have been the way it was done. And so what you can see on this graph is this is three, if it's, if it's an average of three, this is an average of five, this is an average of seven, okay? And obviously, the longer the period of time, right, the smoother it's gonna be, right? The same as the 14-day average for COVID cases is smoother looking than the seven-day or the two-day or the one-day, right? Sort of by definition. So when you go from three to five to seven, it gets smoother, right? Everybody knows that will happen. And the other, so this is a, a, a family of plots they were called within the military in which they asked, the, the statistician was asked to make, to generate these six graphs so that they could decide which one would wind up in the New England Journal of Medicine, right? So uh, in, the, in the columns, it's seven, five, or three. And then the difference between this row and this row is on the y-axis. This one goes down to minus 10. This one goes down to minus 14, right? And it's just like what I told you about with Lotronex, you know, about, about 10 minutes ago. You know, if you go, when it's minus 14, the, 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 the result of that is that the distance between the lines comes together, right? When it's minus 10, the distance between the lines moves apart, even though they've got the exact same shape. Now, of course, if you had all six of these, the one that looks the best is going to be the one that goes down the least far and that is smooth the most. So you'd probably pick A, right? Yeah, that's exactly what they picked, all right? So th that's the way that was done. Your question will be, what do the unsmooth data look like? And I actually uh, received a brown unmarked envelope one day when I was living in San Francisco and it showed the unmarked, the, 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 uh, the unpublished data and they looked like, oops, going the wrong way. They looked like this. That's what the actual unsmoothed data do. 
They're jumping all over the place. And by, by the way, this is probably not even as bad as it actually is because this is the percentage change. If you did it with actual values, it would probably be even worse. So this turns into that. And the military, Redfield, shows up and testifies before the Congress about how they need $20 million to do a phase three trial of this vaccine. I mean, an absolute scandal. In the end, somebody did a phase two trial with a placebo group and the product was a complete and utter dud and they never got to do the phase three trial. Um, by the way, as an aside, he got investigated for this. The military did a whitewash of, a, of an investigation and he was cleared, um, but he was somewhat uh, slapped on the wrist because there was a second investigation. And in the second investigation, it turned out that he and Burks were on the board of something called Americans for a Sound AIDS Policy, which was a right-wing Christian evangelical group that had been advocating for all kinds of things that everybody in aid, everybody who worked in AIDS hated, like condoms didn't work, needles, needle exchanges didn't work, mandatory testing, quarantine of infected people. And Redfield was associated with all of these people um, in the time of the AIDS epidemic. And somehow, or perhaps because of that, he wound up head of the CDC. I'm gonna skip this one. Okay, we're doing a bunch of food related stuff as well because we're a you know, food related group. Um, here are some things we've done. We've had a big focus on occupational health, um, working on personal protective equipment and social distancing, uh, especially in meatpacking plants, which I'm sure all of you know was a complete disaster. Um, the people were all on top of each other, working incredibly quickly, um, massive outbreaks within these, these plants, you know, high percentage of people getting infected, passing it on to their families at home. And the president decided that they were actually essential workers and forced them to all go back to work. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thus exposing them to, to uh, even more infection. But, you know, it's very important that you know, meat production must continue, right? That's what makes them essential. Uh, we're also interested in retail establishments where the same kinds of issues arose. And this was more of an issue in the early part of the pandemic um, where there were questions of should, if you can imagine this, should people um, you know, at Safeway wear masks? Um, well, I suppose if you go to Montana, they probably still have that question, but at least in Washington, nobody has that question anymore. And nobody has a question of whether or not the, 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 the customer ought to be wearing a mask as well. But in the early days, all of those things were up for grabs. Um, so we did a survey of consumer attitudes, which showed high support for mask wearing, a national survey. And we did a survey of the sick leave policies of Safeway and the rest. Uh, and most of them don't have paid sick leave. And if they don't, that makes it more likely that somebody will downplay any symptoms that they might have. Uh, and go to work and then infect their coworkers or the customers. Um, we've also been involved in pushing for an expansion of the SNAP program. The SNAP program used to be called food stamps. And that uh, has been at least at times expanded um, in various ways in the course of this pandemic uh, through congressional action as part of some of these stimulus packages. Um, so we've had some success with that, but recently, um, as you know, the last stimulus package has not gone through. So an extension of that has not taken place. And similarly for school meals, turns out that school meals are a you know, critical way in, by, in, that a number of people you know, and their families get, uh, get fed in the, in the regular course of events. Um, and they even uh, do so over the summer, even when the school is not in session. So those were, all of that was maintained during COVID and um, between SNAP and school meals, vast numbers of meals were delivered to people um, uh, even you know during the pandemic, and uh, so we've been trying to keep all of that uh, going with you know with some success. Uh, we do consumer education. We have a magazine called Nutrition Action, um, which has almost uh, a half a million subscribers. He has a page from it that tries to uh, debunk certain of the the myths uh, related to immunity. Uh, so it goes on for several pages and describes that. Um, and debunking myths is something we're especially interested in. Um, because one thing that you can depend on like clockwork is if a pandemic occurs, be it mad cow, be it swine flu, be it this, uh, you know, people are going to come out of the woodwork to sell stuff that doesn't work. You can, you can you know, bet your bottom dollar that will happen. And uh, of course, that turned out to be the case, and, um, unfortunately. And so uh, here are a few examples. So the first of those is uh, the Reverend Jim Baker. Um, some of you will remember him uh, from the six-year prison, prison term that he 
previously spent when he was uh, convicted of uh, defrauding the people in his congregation. Uh, but uh, after serving his, his, uh, his time, he came back out and uh, he had a second life the way many unscrupulous people do, which is a dietary supplement salesperson. And uh, so here he is uh, selling on his website something called colloidal silver, uh, which is a product with no known biological activity of any significance other than the fact that it can turn your skin blue, uh, sometimes permanently. So uh, he was selling that and people on the right and people in the dietary supplement world have been pushing this colloidal silver for all kinds of stuff going back, you know, as long as one can remember. Um, we also, we asked the FDA and FTC to take action against them and indeed this stuff all ended up coming down and he's being investigated by the New York Attorney General. Um, similarly, we wrote a letter to FDA and the Federal Trade Commission on products that have antiviral claims. So antiviral claims are not permitted under dietary supplement rules because the dietary supplement is only allowed to claim that it affects the quote, structure or function of the body, okay? So what you cannot do if you're a dietary supplement manufacturer is say that your product cures or treats a disease. You're not allowed to say that. You cannot say, or even prevents one, prevents osteoporosis. That is illegal. If you're a dietary supplement manufacturer, you're in trouble because by making a disease claim, you've converted yourself into a drug, right? The way that there are drugs that actually do prevent osteoporosis. And if you are a drug, you are expected to go through FDA to get approval before you come to market. So that means that you have been selling an unapproved drug, which is illegal and a very bad thing to do. So these products get in trouble because they're making illegal disease claims. What they're supposed to do is confine themselves to what are called structure function claims. So instead of saying prevents osteoporosis, they have to say something like, you know, build strong bones. That's okay. Um, uh, but these companies were all uh, straying over the line by saying that their products had antiviral activity. And FDA had previously indicated that calling something antiviral was by definition a disease claim and therefore illegal. So we pointed all of these out to FDA. And we also went after Dr. McCullough, who is the biggest vitamin salesman on the, on the internet. Um, he actually went pretty far in, in his, he's selling a whole variety of things, um, you know, seven or eight different chemicals, probably more. And his suggestion is, you know, to stock up with any of the products that he conveniently sells, and then you will be protected against uh, having a bad outcome with COVID. And so what you should do is just go out and get the infection, okay? This is what he's advising people, and have a strong immune system, thanks to the stuff that he's selling, to defend against it so you won't even display any symptoms. That's what this guy's saying, it's completely extraordinary. Anyway, we put this out. Uh, I got a, they made a video uh, of, of our work uh, trashing um, CSPI and me. Um, I've, I've, got, I've kind of forgotten what he called me. Um, geez, I have to go back up and forgot, but it was like something, you know, I, I can't, it was like, it's it just an extraordinary insult. I mean, I, you know, I don't remember what, charlatan, something, I don't know, like that. It wasn't charlatan, I mean, it, but it was something like that, you know, insane, I don't know, whatever. I should go back. Um, and, uh, in trying to get us to take down our stuff, but of course, we're not gonna do that. Okay, uh, just finishing up, uh, we uh, actually have testified before Congress a couple of times in the course of this pandemic. Uh, the first one I did, it was about so-called repurposed drugs. These are drugs that are typically on the market uh, and for one purpose, and then somebody gets the idea that they'll work uh, very well for COVID. Um, usually that doesn't turn out to be true, uh, but people are excited about this because it seems like it'll be easy and quick and cheap. Um, and we already know whether or not they're safe. Um, so we had a whole hearing on repurposed drugs, which gave me a chance to talk about um, hydroxychloroquine that you all know about, and also another drug called famotidine, which is, you know, Zantac, you know, uh, just a straight up uh, uh, antacid really. And somebody got the idea that it would work for COVID. Great. Um, uh, and then some of those dietary supplement scams, the ones that I just had on the previous slide, were the subject of some testimony that a colleague of mine gave to, before this committee. Um, so we've uh, testified a couple of times, which is you know, pretty good. Um, we've also put together a couple of letters. Adrian, I think you might have signed at least one of these. 
Um, I, the first one was around the time that they were going after Tony Fauci big time, um, they, where Peter Navarro was saying that he'd been wrong on everything. That's a trade representative, which apparently being a trade representative qualifies one for being an expert on infectious disease, who knew. And, um, uh, you know, wrote a piece in, 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 uh, in the USA Today, and the administration was uh, circulating to journalists uh, a list of things that Tony Fauci had gotten wrong. Um, so they were really going after him big time. So we put together a letter supporting him, 4,000 people eventually signed it. Um, and I think hopefully that made a little bit of a difference. Then we used the same technique uh, at some point in the pandemic, which I can't, can't even remember anymore <laughs> because it moves so fast. Uh, but at some point it seemed like a good idea to stand up for vaccine standards and transparency. I still think it is. Uh, but uh, at some critical point, we thought that that made sense. So this was a more restricted sign-on letter. It had only 400 people on it, still a lot, um, but we restricted it to people with you know, clear expertise. And we got you know, all these letters. We had like former Surgeon Generals on them, former CDC directors, former FDA commissioners, uh, big shots in vaccines, uh, really quite effective, I think. And then there've been sign-ons from all kinds of other organizations on all these topics and some others that I can't remember anymore. And we you know, often get involved in those as well. And um, the last thing I'll just touch on before I stop um, is uh, FDA Advisory Committee. So you might've read about this. It took place just this past Thursday. I mentioned when I talked about Federal Advisory Committee Act in the first part of this talk, that there is an opportunity for an open public hearing. And uh, Adrian is a you know, frequent person at those I know. Uh, and I've been there a number of times myself. You can show up in this period, you get three minutes, sometimes five if you're lucky, to make a presentation. And so there was a public session in this FDA advisory committee meeting, went on for an hour and a half. There were 26, I think, people who testified. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, it, it, you know, it, it can, they can make a difference. Sometimes what happens in the public testimony makes a difference. Other times they just wait till it's over and, and uh, move on to the next thing. So uh, they just had the meeting, like I said. The meeting um, uh, was not a meeting to, uh, about a particular uh, vaccine because no vaccine has so far progressed far enough uh, to be presented to a committee like this. So it was called what's called a general matters meeting. And the general matters meeting is one that talks about general matters related to vaccine approval. So that's going to be what, what the outcome measures are gonna be, how long the trial should be, what statistical th techniques you're going to use, uh, what the, you know, how long you follow people for, all that kind of thing, right? So they talked about these general issues, not about particular ones. Um, this matters because the FDA has said in guidance that it will not uh, approve a vaccine for COVID unless there is a, vi a, a meeting of this advisory committee beforehand. And what that means is that this one didn't count because it wasn't on a particular matter, it was on a general matter. And that means that they are gonna to have to schedule a new uh, meeting for any candidate vaccine. And I can tell you, because when I was at FDA, I put those meetings together, they do not happen overnight. I mean, for one thing, as I told you, the Federal Advisory Committee Act has a 15 day notice requirement so that people are told that the meeting is coming up. So that put 15 days additional right on it. And so when people were saying, will there be a vaccine in time for the election? The thing that actually prevented it more than anything was the requirement to schedule this meeting. Um, and so, well, obviously at this point, there's not gonna be a, a vaccine that's approved uh, in time for that, but uh, because we're so close, but, but that's the actual reason why it couldn't ever have happened. Uh, okay, and I talked about the same things I always talk about, which is scientific rigor and transparency and all the documents that ought to be made public and uh, how the agency needs to, you know, stick with good science, which um, I think they will try and do. Um, I actually believe that, I, at least at the non-political levels in the organization, I believe that they will do that. Uh, there's lots of indication of that. The question is what happens above and whether or not Health and Human Services or the White House gets involved. Um, but who knows, maybe there'll be a change in who's in those offices very soon. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Uh, let me get out of here. I'll stop sharing. And I, yeah, that's pretty good for time.
Okay. So I'm happy to take any questions, I would say about one of three topics. One is anything on the first part of the talk. Second, anything on the second part of the talk. And the third one is if it's of interest to, to folks, and I think Adrian usually encourages me to talk about this. Um, you know, if you have questions about this, uh, you know, career trajectory of mine, you know, a fair amount of which has actually been described in the course of this talk and, you know, how it came to be, et cetera, et cetera. So I will stop and take any questions. Is that good? Yeah. Great. That was such a fantastic talk, Peter. Thank you. A really whirlwind uh, tour through um, effective NGO advocacy. Uh, that, was, that was really great. And thank you for the world premiere of the COVID talk. It's, that's astounding what you guys are doing on um, COVID um, and how wonderful. We're definitely going to take advantage of, um, of, um, of those resources of your blog and the, the hub. Yeah, I, I, I did put um, the, the, the hub and the blog. I put the, I put the, uh, uh, the website, the URL is on them. Uh, and you're welcome to share the slides with the students if you want to since I did send them to. to okay, to great. Yes. And I know that we, we, we put something in chat as well. And um, I know that at least one of the happy students, the happy students are um, are required to assess an advisory committee uh, meeting. And um, at least one of them went to the vaccine meeting, I know. So there they're, they're, uh, they're may be some comments about that as, um, as well. Yeah, definitely. I'll be interested <laughs> to hear what they thought. Yeah. Um, students. Thank you.